Welcome, this is a short introduction to the concepts of symbols and data types in computer programming. The ability to create and manipulate symbols distinguishes humans from nearly every other organism on the planet and may be at the root of our intelligence. Computer programmers explicitly harness the power of symbols to build software. There are essentially two types of symbols, variables, whose values can change, and constants, whose values can't change. In the programming snippet below, you can see two examples of constants, kilometers per mile and gallons per liter, and two examples of variables, miles per gallon, kilometers per liter. If you think about it, kilometers per mile is a physical constant that is never going to change value regardless of which program you use it in. On the other hand, different cars get different fuel efficiencies, and so miles per gallon, kilometers per liter, are likely to change even within the same program. At the bottom you can see the formula we use to convert miles per gallon into kilometers per liter. There are basically two issues you need to worry about when you're thinking about symbols, in other words variables and constants. The first issue is what to name your variables and the second one is what data type your variable has. Starting with naming, Romeo and Juliet's famous relationship was doomed because they were from rival families and so the names that they held sealed their fate. While perhaps not quite as dramatic uh, in programming, what you name stuff is important and could seal your fate if done poorly. Which is why we've come up with the concept of naming conventions. These are rules for how to determine the names of things like variables, constants, projects, and files. If you look at the image at the top of this slide, you'll see a file name uh, for a Photoshop file. .psd is Photoshop. This is probably a file at a graphic design company or something like that. But you can see here that the file name is made up of a project number, client name, short project description, designers initials and a revision number. If everyone follows this naming convention that means everyone will be able to almost at a glance be able to tell what's in a file without even opening it even if they have never opened it before. And you know also they'll be able to keep everything sorted by project, uh, we'll be able to to sort by the designer and be able to tell lots of things about these files just by the name. These name conventions are enforced by people, not software for the most part, and they've evolved to help people collaborate on projects over time, keep things organized, uh, not lose them, etc. Right? So you can imagine with the naming convention in the, in the picture here, even if you get a new employee, uh, they'll be able to understand what's in the file even if they weren't a part of the original project. There's a great Wikipedia article on naming conventions. The link is here. I uh, strongly recommend that you take a look at it. Okay, so here are two code snippets uh, which give you some examples of bad and good naming. Uh, we'll start with the bad. Uh, both of these code snippets do the same thing, which is convert uh, kilometers per liter to miles per gallon. Uh, on the left, we've got nice short variable names, but who the heck knows what they mean? They're cryptic, right? X, Y, A, B. Um, if, unless you happen to know what KPL is, B equals A times X times Y doesn't really tell you anything about what this program does and gives you no basis to decide whether or not it's correct. On the other hand, if you look at the program on the right, the snippet on the right, uh, we use meaningful short variable names and the formula at the bottom, KPL equals MPG times KPM times GPL, uh, is instantly recognizable as a correct formula for doing this kind of conversion. Uh, more generally speaking, some common strategies for naming variables and constants are to abbreviate, as we had in this, did in this example, to use something called camel case, which removes all the spaces from a name and capitalizes the second and subsequent words, or sometimes all the words. Something called snake case, which replaces the spaces with 
underscores making the word look kind of like a snake in at least somebody's eyes and then kebab case which replaces spaces with hyphens making the entire name look skewered like a shish kebab basically when you're naming things you want to be consistent you want to be concise you want to choose meaningful names and you also want to know and follow your community standard that might not just be your company but it could be uh, the open source community, the global community, the, you know, the group of people in the Ruby or the PHP or the Python community all have different habits and preferences as to how they name things. You need to know what those are and follow them. It will make it easier for you, for you to read and understand other people's code. And it'll make it easier for other people to read and understand your code. And that's important if you're trying to get a job or keep a job. So once you've got a good name, it's also important to think about the data type. Data types are essentially a shorthand for how your computer programming language is going to allocate and store your variables and constants either on the hard drive or in main memory uh, or on some other sort of medium. Uh, every time you create a variable, the programming language has to allocate some memory for that variable. Uh, and the, the shape of that uh, memory allocation, uh, where it exists, you know, are they side by side, are they spread around the disk, all of those will be determined in part uh, by the programming language, but also by the type of the variable, right? The type of the data that you're storing. When we talk about this, we talk about them in terms of primitive or scalar types and composite types. Uh, primitive types are the most basic types of uh, data that you can have. They can't be broken down any further. So a Boolean value is a true or false value. Uh, an integer is a, an integer number. A floating point is a decimal number. A character is a single character and a string is an array of characters. Uh, in some programming languages, string is actually a composite type. In some programming languages, it is a primitive type. Um, I probably should have put it in both columns. My, my apologies. Composite types like enum, which is enu short for enumerated, which is a uh, data type for holding categorical data. Um, arrays can hold a list of uh, different types of data. Uh, we have, we'll have a whole video on arrays. Objects and structs are also other uh, composite types that you'll need to learn about as you go through uh, learning how to program. Before we look at some exa actual examples of code, uh, I want to talk about the concept of dynamically versus strongly typed languages. This is a defining feature of a programming language and it's a very important consideration when you're choosing what language you want to implement your project in. First of all, a strongly or statically typed language. Uh, the symbol type, right, your variable type, is defined when you declare your variable. It can't be changed easily or frequently at all, uh, even though you may be able to convert it into some other type later on in your program. Strongly or statically typed languages are more rigid, uh, but the errors uh, can be found at compile time instead of runtime, and this can save you uh, hours and days of debugging uh, in the long run. It can also make your programs uh, more efficient in terms of their use of memory, uh, but it, it does require a little bit more overhead, a little bit more work uh, at upfront when you're when you're actually writing the programs. Some examples of strongly or statically typed languages are Java, C, C++, C Sharp, Go, and TypeScript. On the other hand, you have dynamically typed languages. With a dynamically typed language, your variable type is not defined uh, but rather inferred by usage. So you don't ever have to explicitly tell the program what type of data you're using at all. If you give it a value of three, it will infer that it's a numeric type. If you give it a value of Bob, then it will probably infer that it's a string type. These, value, uh, these values can change on the fly. The data types can change on the fly. This is obviously more flexible but uh, the trade-off is that you're more likely to have type-related errors at runtime, and these can be a little bit trickier to run down and debug. 
Some examples of dynamically typed languages are JavaScript, Python, Ruby, R, and PHP. Okay, so now let's dive into some code examples. There are a lot of differences in how data types are implemented across various languages. These examples here are not anywhere close to exhaustive, but they should give you an idea um, about the differences and also motivate you to educate yourself about the, you know, more deeply about data types in the languages that you choose to learn. Starting with JavaScript, uh, JavaScript has more or less four primitive types. One of those is the undefined type, which is essentially uh, what data type a variable has before it has been assigned a value. Uh, Boolean for true and false. Number. Number includes both integers and decimals. And string. Uh, everything else in JavaScript is what's considered an object, including a type called object, a type called function, array, and a special type called null. You can see in the code snippet here uh, that we have used a single variable x and we have just redefined it over and over to give it a new value on each line. Uh, this is one of the things you can do in a dynamically typed language. If you want some more information, I highly recommend uh, following the link on this slide to see uh, the overview written by Douglas Crockford. He is one of the world's foremost experts uh, and gurus and one of the people who's helped write and popularize the JavaScript programming language. Next, we'll take a look at Python. Uh, the code snippet you'll see here is very similar to the code snippet that you saw for JavaScript. Uh, there are a number of different data types. Some of them uh, are similar uh, and some of them are not, or some of them are, are new. So for example, uh, list is kind of like array uh, and tuple is kind of like list, except it can't be changed. So it's like a constant array. Um, but one thing to keep in mind in Python is that everything is an object under the hood and that every expression has a Boolean value. So every expression can be reduced to a true value or a false value, uh, which is something important to remember when you're working with Python. R is a programming language which is specifically dedicated to doing statistical analysis. So it has some very special data types called matrix, list, and data frame, which are uh, peculiar to R. You're not gonna see them in pretty much any other language. Uh, and they are designed to facilitate the task of doing statistical analysis. Uh, you also see that you know they use some different terminology. They use the word logical instead of Boolean, but essentially uh, logical values can be true or false and are the same as Boolean and other languages. Ruby is again very similar to Python and everything is an object and they have a little bit simpler list of data types. Ruby has a strange one called symbol, which doesn't exist in any other type. And I'll leave that as an exercise for the listener to go take a look at, uh, see what that symbol type is and figure out what it, what it does. PHP, uh, very similar to Python and Ruby. Variables are declared a little bit differently. You see that they have a dollar sign, but again, uh, it is dynamically typed, so you don't have to declare uh, the variable type ahead of time. Uh, they also have one called resource. Resource is a variable type that stores things like a reference to a file resource or a network connection or a database or something like that. Finally, we reach Java. Java is the first strongly typed language that we're gonna take a look at. If you look at the code snippet here, you can see that the data types that we have, they're a little bit more specific than you've seen before. So whereas other types had maybe only a single type for numeric values that, that covered both integers and decimal numbers, you'll see here that Java has four different data types just to describe integers byte, short, int, and long, all are integer types. And then you've got float and double, which both refer to decimal types. 
So what is the difference between, you know, why do we have all of those different types to describe an integer? Isn't an integer a pretty simple thing? Well, yes and no. The byte data type only uses a single byte of memory. That's eight bits. So if the first bit, which can be zero or one, corresponds to whether this value is positive or negative, then that leaves you with seven bits to determine the actual integer value. Well, with seven bits, each of which can be zero or one, that only allows you to have two to the seventh values. But that's 256 values. That means that if uh, the first bit tells you plus or minus, you can have values between negative 128 and positive 127 using the byte data type. Now that's not a huge range, and that's obviously not going to work if you need integers that are larger than 127 or smaller than negative 128. Um, so for those numbers, you need to use the short, int, or long data type. However, for really small things, especially for uh, big arrays, uh, things come from databases, the byte data type can actually use a very small amount of space on disk and can be a lot more a lot faster and more effective uh, and so you can begin to see how in a, a language like java which is strongly typed uh, if you care about memory management if you care about how you know what the footprint of your program is on disk you may want to be able to have a programming language where you can choose the specific data type so you'll notice here that we have you know whereas in the previous um, code examples we use the same variable over and over again x uh, in this example we're not able to reuse any of the variables that's because once you declare a variable of a particular type uh, you can't assign uh, a value of a different type to it so we have a byte variable y and a short variable s int variable i etc the only other one that i'll i'll draw your attention to is the last two so we have one called string. Uh, we've got a string variable that we've named high and assigned a value of high. And then the next one, we've got an array of characters or chars, as some people say. Uh, this variable we've called h2, and we've assigned it two uh, values, h and i. Um, these two variables, high and h2, are essentially equivalent, right? They, they both contain the same data uh, and they can be output and used in much the same way. Um, string is just a convenience class which allows you to find string variables, which is one of the most common things that people do when they're programming. Finally, uh, we have some code in Go. Go is a relatively new programming language. Um, and as you can see here, it's got quite a bit of complexity to it. Uh, there are actually 12 different data types which refer just to integers. So you see here uint, uint8, etc., etc., down to rune. All 12 of those are different types of integers which use uh, different amounts of data to represent them and some of them are aliases for others. You've got two types of floats and two types of complex numeric types. Uh, there are actually a lot of other data types in Go. Uh, I didn't, wasn't able to get them all on here, uh, but if you are interested in a newer, more experimental language, uh, I strongly encourage you to take a look at their tutorial and to dive in a little bit deeper. Okay, that's it for our code examples. To summarize, symbols, also known as variables and constants, are a fundamental component of pretty much every programming language. When you write your code, you should have an explicit strategy for naming things. And whether your programming language is dynamically typed or strongly typed, uh, all of them implement some form of data type system which determines how memory is allocated and how symbols are stored. While most of the time it's not gonna be necessary for you to spend a lot of time focusing on the data type of your variables, it is important to understand that the concept and that data types exist and to understand the ramifications of choosing one type or another when you're writing your programs. Hope this has been useful. Please let me know if you have questions. Have a great day.